The act of prayer has always been part of man's religious life. And from the beginning, the human being has instinctively realized that he was in the presence of a pattern of existence greater than himself. Probably the more remote a culture is in time from the present day, the more powerful the instinct for prayer is noted. Primitive man had so few resources in himself. He understood so little of the world in which he lived. And he was surrounded by so many mysteries that it was very easy for him uh, to sense or to create within himself a pattern of existence peculiar to his own needs and within the area of his own understanding. There are many records of ancient prayers. Most of them are beautiful documents. They represent some of the loftiest ideals of the human race. From the beginning, prayer was the expression of an urgent need. It also expressed in simple, forthright way man's acceptance of the pattern of life to which he belonged. I think in terms of therapy, the most important single factor in the prayer policy or prayer practice is this instinctive acceptance of man's place in the plan of things. The individual became in his prayer humble and at the same time hopeful. The combination of humbleness and hopefulness are essential or is essential to man's inner security. Without a certain amount of acceptance, the individual will never find peace of soul. We are all inclined to struggle, to fight for things that we believe or opinions that we hold dear. We have declared a kind of war against inevitables. We resent the immutable processes occurring around us and within us. Resentment in itself creates tension. And this endless sense of defensiveness with which we try to force our own purposes upon a reluctant world, this itself contributes to sickness. It causes us to live in a more or less continuous agitation, burdened with the most negative attitudes which we can hold or conceive. To live in a world of negations, a world of hopeless situations, is very bad. Also to live in a world in which we must depend upon other human beings for all our needs. This is also bad. It is true that we are interdependent. That through the services and achievements of each other, our lives here can be improved. But to make this type of improvement the complete answer to our question is to deceive ourselves. We learn perhaps from bitter experience 
that there are parts of our natures which cannot be um, understood by other people, problems which people cannot solve. The solution must come from within ourselves, from our own attitudes and our own acceptances. Thus, while we may depend upon outside help in the various physical activities of living, we may turn to others for judgment or assistance in time of emergency. Still, there are other kinds of emergencies which are very near to us, for which outside help is of small assistance. No matter how much we get in the term of assistance or cooperation, unless we can accept this help with some kind of inner insight, unless the kind things that are done to us and for us create within ourselves a certain gratitude, unless we are grateful creatures by consciousness, the service of other people very seldom solves much of our problem. Thus, each individual must develop within himself some kind of inner relaxation. He must find in his own nature the source of all the good that he hopes will occur to him during his years of living. He has to develop a kind of pattern of life, and life breaks down into two essential patterns. One is aggressive, the determination of the individual to impose his own will upon other things, and the other is essentially submissive, the willingness of the individual to accept uh, those situations which are greater than himself. Now, we in the West are inclined to the more aggressive attitude. We like to believe that we can solve in the common, everyday way of things all of our problems. And this is especially true in a materialistic, mechanistic culture. Materialism causes us to doubt the presence of divine availables. And uh, our mechanistic concept overshadows us with the prodigious achievements of each other. We seem to be constantly on the threshold of vast discoveries which might solve our problems. But when these discoveries are made, if they are made, the problems continue. And the contributions of material knowledge, while they are helpful, are not solutional as far as our inner lives are concerned. If materialism of itself could solve things, very few problems would remain today. For while it is true that we have never previously experienced uh, such a tremendous expansion of material knowledge, men have been groping for material solutions for thousands of years. Every culture has produced some uh, materialists. It has also produced inventors, various artisans and craftsmen capable of providing an ever-increasing number of comforts and conveniences for mankind. Yet in the long run of history, we are still plagued with the most primordial problems of our kind. We have solved very little in term of essential. We have accomplished much in secondary matters, but primary problems still confront us with the same uh, terrible pressure that we have known from the very beginning. So I think we have to assume that man's effort to conquer the world as a means of the solution to his own problem uh, is a very a desperate and unreasonable attitude. 
We can solve many things, but the problems always remain. As opposed to this attitude of aggressiveness, there has always been a small group of human beings of mystical uh, inclinations who have recognized that the only answer lies in acceptances, that the individual must acknowledge certain values, which perhaps he cannot entirely rationalize. But these problems, though imponderable, are real and immediate. And from the need for acceptance, there emerges a very large pattern of consequences, of situations that can be met only by humility. And with our acceptance comes this factor of humility. The individual acknowledging that he is not master of others or masters of his world. This realization that we are part of something, that this something of which we are a part extends far beyond uh, the mortal framework that we can daily observe. This uh, pattern goes beyond cities and nations and policies and laws and leagues. It has much deeper meaning than treaties and obligations of a political or legislative nature. Man has built this tremendous material way of life upon the surface of a natural sphere. And this sphere continues its natural course regardless of man carrying him as it always has in this great circular march or procession around the sovereignty of the sun. So in all of the emergencies of life, we suddenly experience a helplessness. We have to have some form of inner stability. And this inner stability must be the cause of our external security. Our prop, uh, popular attitude has been that if we could create social security, if we could create a civilization in which man was made safe for man, all other good things would come to us. Under some utopian scheme, we would have available everything necessary for life. Crime would diminish. Poverty would cease. The underprivileged would have an opportunity. And under a utopian system, the individual would have fair reason to live a good life. We have attempted a few utopias along the way of history. They have all been more or less dismal failures for they proceeded from the wrong premise, namely that if you can preserve man's environment, you can preserve him. The fact of the matter is that environment is nothing but a continual outflowing from man himself. Man creates his environments, and man experiences in the course of time the impossibility of the situations he himself has created and is forced to turn from them or reform them or revise them or change them to his more immediate need. Thus, the entire concept of religion is based on the problem of the individual first making himself right. And that if he will be right himself, then all other things necessary will be added unto him. In our present time, this type of thinking is not entirely fashionable, but it is increasing in interest every day to persons who are heavily problemed. Of those heavily problemed, probably those under intense psychic pressure uh, are carrying the heaviest burden. The individual who is sick in himself, 
whose life values have collapsed, who is unable to control his own mind or emotions, who is unable to regulate his own actions and moderate his own conduct. Such an individual is probably as sick as any human being can be. This is not the kind of sickness that can ordinarily respond uh, to the healing procedures of our time. And because of this peculiar mental disintegration that seems to be increasing constantly, uh, psychology uh, was more or less created. It came into being to meet this urgent problem of man's inner life. Unfortunately, however, uh, psychology really began to crystallize before it even had a chance to mature. And little by little, uh, the psychologist has fallen under uh, the delusion which he was really intended to correct, namely the belief, once again, that it is possible by scientific or rational means uh, to change the inner life of the individual with or without his consent, that what might be termed normalcy was a technical situation which could be brought about by scientific means alone. Here we have found again that we were desperately wrong. Sometimes the psychologist is able to convince an individual of his own mistakes, to show him why and how the difficulties through which he is passing are due to his own wrong attitudes toward life. If the psychologist is successful in doing this, he has certainly made a valid contribution. But too often the victim or the patient is in no condition uh, to actually solve the situations which the psychologist points out. Instead of being able to take this uh, useful information as to his own mistakes and settle down to the quiet process of correcting these mistakes, the patient suddenly discovers that to correct the situation, to change oneself, to settle down to the quiet process of remaking our own personality, such a procedure requires skills that we do not possess. We do not possess them because we have never been encouraged to possess them. We have had very few examples uh, of such possession to assist us. We have never been taught the rudiments of self-culture. And lacking the information, we are like a person presented with an advanced mathematical problem who has never taken primary arithmetic. We may recognize the advisability of change, but we lack within ourselves the strength of libido. We lack the force to bring about change in ourselves. We become again one of these procrastinating mortals who perhaps will say when I retire from business, when my children are grown, when my responsibilities are less, then I will attempt this magnificent experiment in self-culture. Obviously, such procrastination ends in failure. No one gets around to it. Um, life ends without the person ever getting the time or the energy allotment to make the changes that he recognizes to be needed. So without some form of organized strength in our own natures, the changing of ourselves is an extremely difficult procedure. The watchfulness by which we might guard our thoughts or our words or our emotions, this watchfulness is not available to us. Uh, the kindliness which might prevent us from damaging others and being in turn damaged ourselves, this kindliness is not in sufficient 
quantity in ourselves to lead us into any general improvement. We do not understand why we should change. We do not know why this terrible task should be imposed upon us, contrary to every mortal instinct that we possess. We do not know why we should be unselfish. And uh, in a way, this has caused many people to turn almost belligerently against religion, demanding to know why religion should force frustration upon them, when all they really want in this world is to do as they please, and they cannot understand why they should not be permitted to do so. Most of us, however, realize that other people should not do as they please. Only ourselves. <laughs> when other people do as they please, it always interferes with our doing as we please. And this problem of three billion people interfering with each other is the great social dilemma of our time. Recognizing that there is a need for something here to change the focal point of the person. Time and experience have indicated that the most reasonable solution to this problem lies in religious insight. We might also be able to solve the problem on a purely ethical level. Ethics as a part of philosophy will not only give us an adequate moral code, but it will also rationalize that moral code. It will explain to us why it is necessary for us to achieve self-discipline. It will prove to us the common benefits arising from self-improvement. It will prove to us beyond question that if we could achieve a, su a sufficient ethical standard we might be able to overcome war and crime and poverty and selfishness. The ethical pattern is reasonably adequate, but what is absent in the ethical situation almost inevitably is emotional warmth. The individual is expected to do good because it is good. He is expected to obey the rules of ethics as he might obey the laws of a community. He will only obey the community laws if they are enforced, and it is his natural instinct to seek to evade these laws and to gain a certain sense of satisfaction if he can break them without being punished. <clears throat> Thus, ethics by itself lacks... Uh, the tremendous sense of emotional participation. The individual does not experience or feel the love for ethics. He respects it, he admires it, he acknowledges it, but he does not love it for itself. He does not find in it a deep emotional satisfaction. He is not impelled to the sacrifice of his own personality by his emotional attachment to something greater than himself. Thus, we may say human relationships can be rationalized. There are in this country at the present time hundreds of thousands of homes that are being sustained on a rationalistic basis. Uh, they are uh, more practical than separate living. The children must be considered. Expenses and taxes. Our various personal ambitions and satisfactions must be considered. But where homes are held together simply by legal means or by the fear of the expense and misery of separation, we do not have a true home. We have only a true home when it is held together by the honest affections of the members. In the same way, in searching for a true ethics, we will never find it unless it is sustained by the love of man, 
by a deep respect and veneration for principles that are necessary and right. This has always been the weakness of ethics and is the reason why a materialistic culture, even though it may have strong ethical principles, seldom survives any great length of time. Ethics are certainly better than nothing, but they are not the full answer to the situation. Uh, where you find a parent, for example, fulfilling its duty to a child, a duty founded in ethics, we can still have a very inadequate family life. Unless the parent has a real deep and personal affection for that child, and this affection transcends the parent's love for himself, causing the parent to be willing to sacrifice his own pleasures for the good of the child and to make this sacrifice joyously because of affection. Where this situation does not prevail, uh, the child is, is cheated of a very large part of its proper environmental assistance. So we have in uh, the problem of human thinking, human living, the realization that we must have somewhere a reason or a motive or a conviction or a realization or an intuition strong enough to cause us to change our own ways. Now we can very often have done this to a degree. Civilization has produced some of these incentives. As a result of that, certain evils, certain ills that were once common have become comparatively rare. We do grow through common association, but this growth is very slow and painful. And furthermore, of course, we release first under Reformation the lesser of our own ills. The individual who has several faults is inclined to recover from the least of them first, because the least of them has the least attachment within his own consciousness. It is the basic mistakes, those we have long clung to, that are the hardest to change. We also realize that while philosophy can rationalize a great many things, and to a group of intellectuals provide a powerful argument in favor of integrity, faith has a more direct approach to this entire problem. First of all, faith does not require the massive intellectualism that is necessary to an advanced understanding of philosophic ethics. The average person is not that much of a student. He is not going to devote years to the study of abstract ethical principles. He is not going to reconcile uh, the various contending schools of ethics. He is not going to go through the laborious procedure of trying to understand what good men of all time have meant by virtue, or how they have been able to apply their virtuous convictions to the situations around them. We will go so far as to realize that these good people have received the approbation and approval of all history. But still, it does not touch us directly. It is too big a problem, too remote from our daily experience, and too exhausting to our already rather fatigued natures. This is especially true if we are under psychic stress, when we are in the poorest possible condition to study anything, and will most certainly find that our own resources are too sick to support us in this quest for a noble learning. It doesn't seem to uh, be possible to work things out on this basis. On the other hand, faith presents us with something uh, that cuts through most of the red tape that involves living. 
Faith has about it a simpleness, a directness. And in faith, by some wonderful circumstance, we bind together both wisdom and ignorance. We take the person of great learning, as in the case, for example, of a Plato or a Pythagoras, and we find that this learning has finally consummated itself in a tremendous vital faith. If philosophy had not led ultimately to the experience of faith, it could never have survived as a method of instruction. Philosophy merely provided the rational material upon which to build the foundation of an abiding belief in something. On the far opposite point of this, we have the person who is not philosophical, who has no intention or inclination uh, toward the improvement of his mind to this degree. He would be the last to assume that he was capable of being philosophically oriented. To him, the only approach to life that is solutional is a very simple and direct acceptance of values which he cannot fully understand, but which he admires, which he inwardly realizes to be reasonable and true without the intellectual procedure of attainment. Faith, therefore, becomes a very simple, natural approach to conviction. And from faith we gain certain very simple and natural convictions useful to us. Faith, for the most part, is founded upon some religious conviction. Faith is the individual accepting the great spiritual teachers of his race, accepting the religious organizations that minister to his spiritual requirements, accepting the scriptures and words which he believes to be inspired and to have descended from holy or divine sources. So faith causes the person to accept a pattern like the Golden Rule, or the Sermon on the Mount, or the Lord's Prayer, without attempting to analyze his faith, without trying to decide what language these documents were first written without trying to explore or examine the possible alternate meanings of words, without going to the laborious problem of trying to find out to his own satisfaction whether these words were actually spoken by the teacher to whom they are accredited or whether they were devised at some other time. All these problems which must constantly plague the scholarly mind, are fortunately uh, not likely to perturb the devout and simple and sincere believer. The believer's primary pro problem always is, is what I believe believable to me? Uh, in some instances, the answer is in a negative. The various patterns of belief with men change. That which we believe at one period of life does not seem to be acceptable at another. We are disillusioned for one reason or another. And because of this disillusionment, uh, because of experiences which uh, undermine our faith, uh, this factor in our consciousness may increase or decrease at different periods of living. Actually, however, faith is not finally uh, based upon persons, even though these persons may be messiahs or great prophets. Actually, faith is based upon the integrity of the message itself. Faith is based upon our own immediate recognition of the virtues of concepts. Faith is based upon the fact that in our hearts we know that these words 
have a ring of truth in them, no matter who said them or when they were said. Faith, as it unfolds, therefore, is not easily disturbed by controversy or criticism. It is more likely to cling to the dreamed ideal, to cling to something that is so noble, so beautiful, so acceptable that we no longer uh, even have the inclination to doubt its authenticity. A fair example of such a, a sense of faith and acceptance lies in the golden rule. This has been propounded all over the world by teachers for at least 3,000 years of historic time. We do not question it. We do not need any more to try to decide who first revealed it. It belongs to something that it seems reasonable in ourselves to accept. We cherish it whether we can fulfill its demand or not. And even while perhaps we are breaking it, we know that the golden rule is good. Out of our various experiences in living, we come therefore finally to the acceptances of certain good things which we have by experience itself come to admire or to acknowledge or to affirm. And in this very process of faith, we discover a part of ourselves that previously perhaps had not been apparent to us. We are sometimes surprised to find that inside of us we believe more beautiful things than we would intellectually acknowledge. Sometimes in our mental processes we are disturbed by our own faith. Sometimes we wonder how we can hold on to beautiful convictions when our lives have become so heavily troubled in the material and practical things of daily experience. The fact seems to be that within ourselves is this ever-flowing fountain of faith, that in our own natures there is something at the root of ourselves which intuitively senses reality, that finds in that which is essentially beautiful and essentially good a great consolation and comfort, a sense of well-being, and unless we are terribly conditioned against it, uh, this natural instinct comes to our assistance and makes the act of faith easier for us. Faith, of course, by giving us a certain sense that we live in a universe ruled over by a benevolent principle, this type of faith uh, causes us to become dependent for justice, for truth, for happiness, for security, for health, even for survival itself, upon this larger principle. That in some mysterious way, we are all of us under continual need of this larger life, this massive, ponderous, wonderful something that overshadows our known experiences. Under these conditions, then, it is not hard for us uh, to gradually come into a receptive relationship with life, an accepting relationship. For those things which we cannot do in our own way and for ourselves, we must seek help. And if these things are obviously proper and necessary, we must have faith that nature can bring them about. Faith, therefore, uh, creates also a sense of continual expectancy of good. Whereas the person who is seriously afflicted in his judgment becomes constantly expectant of ill, and meets each new infirmity as something to be expected. Faith 
causes us to become hypersensitive to good. It helps us to recognize uh, a greater amount of universal benevolence operating around us and in us. Uh, the critic uh, overlooks uh, the one thing that is good and emphasizes in his own consciousness the nine misfortunes that have occurred. Uh, the devout person has a tendency to forget the misfortunes and to make much of the one thing that was very good. And by so doing, accomplishes a therapy for himself. For faith is a healing power. Faith, by causing the individual to develop a constructive inner attitude towards existence, certainly helps to normalize functions that are otherwise under too great tension or stress. Faith leads to relaxation, whereas doubt leads to tension. Faith causes the individual uh, to free himself from a great burden of pressure, whereas doubt or criticism will only contribute more pressure. It seems then that there is a reason why history and human experience uh, unite in proclaiming that something good really does happen to people who believe in good. Whether this good occurs because uh, they have tuned into some divine uh, source of good, or whether this good arises from the improvement in their own attitude toward life, is not the problem for the moment. The problem is that faith heals sickness, and the lack of faith contributes to sickness. Of this there can be no doubt. Uh, the individual without faith, without inner believing, without the power of accepting the situations that arise around him, this individual is too brittle. He lacks the ability to adapt and adjust. He is deficient in gratitude, and in that way alienates his friends. He is deficient in unselfishness. Therefore, he imposes upon others who become embittered. He is deficient in forgiveness, and because he does not forgive, he is not forgiven. He is hasty in judgment, and because he judges, he is judged. So out of the lack of the gentleness, the kindliness, uh, the compassion, which comes to him from a strong inner faith, he continues to compound his own miseries. And little by little, wrong habits transform themselves into ailments. And the person who has lived the first half of his life uh, by an unhealthful mental and emotional standard is apt in the latter part of life uh, to suffer physical ailments which detract from his efficiency and his comfort. All of this leads up to the acts of faith and how these acts operate in our experience. Faith is something uh, that has to be maintained or preserved in some way. The real believer can never allow his faith to be taken for granted by himself. If his faith is simply an acceptance of the beliefs of others, it will not sustain him. It must be something that is enriched by his own uh, participation. It is sanctified by his own attitude. And without this immediate contribution from himself, his faith will not survive or fulfill itself. Most individuals who are unhappy in this world are unhappy because of images which are set up in their own psychic entities. And we all have an image that has been more or less outraged, and that is the image 
of the individual who has imposed upon us. The image of an experience or a sequence of experiences in which some simple natural need uh, which we reached out to fulfill has been blighted or has been in some way exploited. Therefore, most psychic problems relate to disillusionments. They relate to the individual who never had the experience of a good childhood, who never found in earthly parents companionship or understanding, who reached out for love and did not gain the love they needed, particularly in those formative periods when their mental natures were not able to cope with disillusionments. So in every person there seems to be a great need for a parental power, a great need to believe in something or someone who is true, who is real, who cannot and will not fail, and who has a certain immediate sympathy for the weaknesses in ourselves. We have a great demand for understanding. We have a great need for someone to whom we can tell the story of our troubles. In the um, psychological area, there has been a considerable development of simply psychological listeners individuals whose only function is to let the patient talk, to tell his story, to get out of his system his antagonisms and his disappointments, his hurts and his betrayals. Somehow if we can simply tell this story to someone who understands, it is a great help. It reduces the pressure within ourselves. We get some form of objectivity where only subjectivity existed before. Religion, then, from the very beginning, has consisted of both public and private prayer. Public prayer used to be associated with festivals, with the ceremonies to the various deities that were part of the state religions of peoples. Private prayer has always been the conviction of man that he could personally approach uh, the invisible spiritual source of life, and that some way this invisible source could understand him, would realize the, the facts that disturb or perturb this human life. Of course, from a standpoint of even religion, this was a rather inconsistent situation if you try to think it through. The inconsistency lying in the fact that we assume the universe to be sustained by an all-conscious power. That this all-conscious power, therefore, must inevitably know the need of its creation. That we should have to call the attention of God to our need uh, is to in some way impose limitation upon deity. To ask deity to defend our cause against someone else's cause also, this other cause uh, having its supplication to divinity for success. This all makes a rather confusing picture, but mysticism has broken through this with a certain very simple answer. It is true that deity is all conscious, that the universal uh, pattern of things is fulfilling itself inevitably that there can be truly no sparrow's fall that is not noted, that in a way it is um, almost a sacrilege uh, to assume that anywhere within this vast pattern of existences there could be a place or a condition or a time or a person uh, which deity has overlooked. Actually, however, as the mystic points out, this is not the problem. This vast experience of universal life is there. This vast inner light of things, a million times more luminous than the light of the sun, shines forever in space. The great fountains of benevolence will never cease to flow. 
and this whole vast fra fabric or framework which we call the world is suspended forever from the consciousness of the Creator. But this is not the major issue. It is not actually uh, that we are trying to call the attention of deity to our need. It is a matter of our own ability to become aware of this universal presence. The uh, act of prayer, therefore, is not man calling upon deity to approach but rather man opening the door of his own soul so that he may know and experience the deity that is eternally there. It isn't that he is reaching out, asking not to be overlooked. The real fact is that the act of prayer simply creates in man a willingness to accept the actual omnipotence and omnipresence of the divine reality. It is a statement against his own doubt, against man's doubt. It is therefore man suddenly becoming inwardly receptive to a state of things that has always existed. Prayer, therefore, is simply man making it possible for himself to gain a certain conscious rapport with the universe. It is man who is opening the door of benevolences. It is man who is permitting the divine to operate in himself, not because it would not otherwise operate, but because there is a great advantage in man becoming aware of this operation, becoming personally a sponsor of the presence of deity in his own life. So we have in prayer actually man bringing himself into sympathy with a truth that exists whether he is sympathetic to it or not. But if he brings himself into this sympathy, he is then able uh, to use his own faith more constructively in the correction of his own conditions. Through the experience of faith, he gains the experience of strength, the strength that can change things, the strength that can accomplish uh, that which man needs uh, to attain or accomplish in the process of living. In order to gain this relationship, all teachers, all great sages and scholars from the beginning of history have pointed out that man's open sesame into the world of realities is his own quietude, his own acceptance. That whether he accepts or not, he is part of this great living universe. But if he does accept the full import of his relationship to life, then suddenly he gains the conscious strength which was previously unconscious within him. He gains suddenly uh, the power uh, to cooperate with the purpose of existence. In the acts of faith, therefore, also, as uh, Jesus explained to his disciples, the individual uh, should and must cultivate personal worship. Personal worship in the sense of personal quietude. When man wishes to commune with the spirit of life, he must enter into his closet, and he must pray in secret. And the prayers which he prays in secret bring about good things that all men may know. But the, the, the process or act of prayer is therefore a retirement uh, from the confusion and our outward pressure of living into a receptivity, into an acceptance. Now, this does not necessarily mean that the individual cannot engage in community prayer 
or cannot pray with a congregation in a church. The experience is, however, highly individual, regardless of the number of other persons that may be present. Uh, the relationship of consciousness is always internal, and the individual in prayer uh, retires into the quietest parts of his own nature, and in this quietude uh, seeks the help that he needs. An interesting point that um, perhaps has more valid significance than has generally been given to it is that a great many disturbed persons whose mental and emotional condition is far from favorable are still capable of experiencing the power of prayer. Many individuals whose orientations in this world are very badly upset can still um, experience the act of prayer. The individual who perhaps has lost faith in almost everything is still capable of prayer. He is still capable of reaching out in his emergency uh, for help. Unless his mental nature is completely demoralized, he finds that in many degrees of psychic difficulty, his power of prayer does remain and is available to him. This is true also of narcotic addicts and alcoholics and others who are under a very definite personality defects. These people can still pray, can still experience the benefit of prayer, and in many instances they have been very greatly helped by religious programs uh, such as Alcoholics Anonymous. The religious phase of man, it would seem, is continually fighting to come through. It is still struggling even after apparently all is lost. There is somewhere within man, therefore, an extraordinary receptivity to devotion. And this is one of the last faculties that depart in the case of a dangerous mental ailment. Up to the very point of dementia, the individual still has uh, this sense of hope that there is somewhere, something in the universe that he can reach out and cling to in his desperate need. Because man has been given this uh, mysterious inner faith, it is evident that it was hoped or intended that he would build upon it and that from building upon it, he would assure a certain protection for himself in the emergencies of living. Consequently, uh, most persons are better, more successful in their various projects, better adjusted as human beings, if they can create a certain uh, alternation between uh, aggressiveness and acceptance. If every person could set aside even a few minutes a day to the quiet acceptance of universal good, he would protect himself against a great many difficulties. He would also gradually strengthen the only faculty or power which he possesses within himself that is capable of changing his own character he would find that the experience of faith produces within himself so vivid and vital a change that his mental and emotional natures cannot ignore the importance of this change. And persons who have lived very uh, difficult and even uh, delinquent lives have found in the experience of religion uh, a very cleansing and uh, reviving force. And the more sincere the person is, the greater the benefits which will arise uh, from his contact with spiritual values. I think in uh, the problem of prayer, therefore, in the life of the average individual who has problems, and most of us do have problems, is that 
in prayer or in the mood of prayer, we first of all acknowledge the object of prayer. In this case, the supreme object being the divine consciousness of good in the universe. We acknowledge the sovereignty of something greater than we are, thus relieving ourselves both of our own isolation and also the strange kind of egotism which builds within us this desperate determination to live contrary to the universal plan. So our first real advantage in prayer is that as we think about it, as we prepare ourselves for it, there is a certain quality of reminiscence arises in us. We realize a little what is meant by prayer and why we pray and to whom we pray. And all of this is a quiet restatement that we live in a universe of divine plan and divine purpose. That we live within the substance of something uh, which is great enough uh, to permit us to have an everlasting faith in eternal good. If we can just have this mood, only the, the sensing of it, it becomes a very great help to us. It helps us to escape this strange, dark loneliness that leads to mental and emotional sickness. The second point in connection with the problem of prayer is our attitude for what shall we pray. And here, our own insight uh, gives us uh, a certain understanding. Uh, many persons do not possess this understanding. And in this, I think, we have the reason why prayer is not always as effective as we might wish it was. Uh, to the average uh, nominal believer, the universe of the unseen or the religious is simply the extension of the material universe. As we have tried to exploit the material world to our own advantage, so we are inclined, perhaps, to try to exploit the spiritual world for our own advantage. Not for our spiritual advantage, but for our material advantage. Thus, we have a great deal of demand prayer. Prayer in which we simply assume uh, that prayer, prayer is a magical ritual by which we can force the fulfillment of our own desires. In this motive plays a very large part. And I believe that the ancient was perfectly right in his assumption uh, that motive is one of the determining factors in the validity of the prayer ritual. If we try to use prayer as an evasion, as a means of avoiding the legitimate experiences of life, if we try to use prayer to ask God to influence someone else to do what we want them to, I think we're on the wrong track completely. If we use prayer for the gratification of physical things, if we use prayer to advance ourselves socially or politically or economically, I believe that we have made a mistake. We have misunderstood the idea of all other things uh, being made available to us. The actual purpose of prayer is not that we shall change, uh, with the help of God, our environment but rather that we shall unfold with the help of truth our own lives so that uh, we should not uh, assume prayer to be merely a religio-scientific procedure for the gratification of personal desire.
If we do this, we do not really enter into the presence of God with humbleness and acceptance. In the old uh, stories of the tabernacle rituals of the uh, Jews of the Old Testament period, uh, we are told that the high priest, when entering into the Holy of Holies, uh, to uh, offer prayer to the mysterious power of the Shekinah's glory, could not enter the Holy of Holies without first removing all of the robes of glory. He must enter into this holy place without worldly ostentation, uh, without any sense of personal rank or preferment. The same was true in Egypt. When Pharaoh entered into the presence of the great gods of Egypt, he had to leave behind all of the insignia of mortal rank. He had to leave behind all of the prestige and special privileges of rulership. He could only go as a human being with a great need in his soul to ask help. He could not go as a king or a prince. He could not go in any sense in the vanity of his own worldliness. And as the um, worshiper was required to remove the symbols of his external estates, so in the ritual of prayer, he was supposed also to leave behind the requirements, needs, and inclinations of his material estate. He was coming as a child into the presence of his father. He was coming as one seeking to know, seeking instruction, seeking to come into understanding of that which was divinely right. He was not coming for the gratification of his own desires, but that he might open himself and remain receptive to divine desire. Thus, in the prayer situation, the, the great importance of trying to free the mind uh, from all ulterior motives. Because if we go into the holy place, as the ancient Israelite believed, with dislike for our neighbor in our hearts, we entered in vain. If we went in hoping that we could find some divine assistance for the embarrassment of our adversaries, this also made us unfit for worship. We had to go in solely because we were children seeking the consolation of spirit from communion with the eternal parent. If our attitude is right in this, even for a few moments, it is a constant daily restatement of our own conviction about reality, about truth, about principles, about God, nature, and man. If our motives, therefore, likewise, are as they should be, we then do become intuitively receptive to something. Those who enter into the prayer relationship with the simple, uh, unworldly search for insight receive it. They may not receive cosmic consciousness or suddenly find the universe unfolding in all its majesty before them, but they enter into a situation in which a simple need is met. They bring an empty bowl into the presence of the deity and the bowl is filled with the divine wisdom and the divine love. They receive this nutrition that is not of this world. And by the simple strength which comes from the restatement of a basic faith, they go out and carry the burden of living with greater dignity. And if this is part of a regular life pattern, 
It certainly does enrich character and a noble understanding. It makes the person uh, a better, a more relaxed, more peaceful, uh, more accepting human being. Yet in all of this, there is no compromise of principle. Uh, rather, there is perhaps a clearer insight into the immutability of law than we can gain in any other way. If we could carry a little more of this insight with us into our daily action, we might realize that this world in which we live is within the providence of a much greater power, that its laws are immutable, inevitable, and unchangeable, and that it is man's duty to adjust to these and not to attempt to force his own purposes upon all other persons. In many ways, the old concept of prayer, as it was taught by the Pythagoreans and in ancient India, uh, this concept of prayer was very close to meditation. It was the beginning of a meditative discipline. Among those who were dedicated to the holy life, this uh, meditation discipline was more extended. But it was still man becoming quiet and receiving light into his own receptive nature. Prayer assumes that man is receptive to truth. And later, as he goes back into objective living again, this spirit of receptivity stays with him to a degree at least. He is more receptive to knowledge. He is more understanding of his neighbor. He is quicker to sympathize. He is uh, more easily enlightened by the experiences of life because he has learned to accept them rather than to rebel against them or to rationalize them or to confuse them in his own mental habit processes. So in prayer for the average person, we have this meditational factor, this concept which is simply to restate in the simplest form that we know our peculiar realization of need, the need that every living thing has for the life of which it is a part. We can scientifically search for this life and come to many different opinions. But we can also be simply quiet, and this life is experienced in us. And it is this direct experience that transforms the theologies of men into the living faiths of the world. And uh, in this we do have uh, a very great uh, and important experience, an experience of sharing, almost a mystical experience. Prayer can produce this mystical experience uh, quite easily if we give it an opportunity to do so. Another phase of prayer as what we might term psychotherapy lies in the fact that it, re it becomes an exhaustion of pressure in itself. Pressure exhausts by subsiding. Pressure is merely energy poorly used, usually whipped by the mind or by the intensities of the emotions. If the mind and emotions uh, simply do not whip this energy, the tremendous pressures and tensions will not build up. There is only one way, really, of overcoming pressure, and that is by reducing uh, the pressure itself, not by finding too many other outlets by which we can work it off. Actually, quiet acceptances, realizations, of the presence of good and of value, and also this sense 
this almost fatalistic sense that after all, we are here to obey, we must obey, that therefore all rebellion against truth is futile, that we are here to accept life, to understand it, to grow with it and through it, and that we are also here to, re to accept experiences, whether they are pleasant or unpleasant, for by acceptance we learn, by rejection we shut off our own personal growth. So by prayer and the thought that it carries with it of relaxation from self-pressure, we simply permit pressures to, uh, to decline, to retire, to subside within our own natures. And instead of these pressures that are constantly affecting us, we begin to channel energy into new areas that are essentially benevolent. We find, for example, uh, that by insight, by spiritual understanding, we can transform a great many of the doubts on which we uh, under which we live, into very quiet compassions, realizations, and appreciations. Having released ourselves from the self-hypnosis that everything is wrong, we begin to experience the rightness of things that we had previously neglected, free from the terrible pressures of our own egos, we become receptive to beauty, to art, to music. Uh, we find our creativity increases, our hands and our minds uh, make more things that are beautiful. As we get away from this false ego pressure with which we try to fight the struggle of existence, we discover that we have more energy than we suspected, that health can be much improved, uh, that these uh, emotional and mental situations that have practically deluged us are of slight importance, and that beyond them and far more important is this great radiant universe of constructive law, of constructive growth, and of unfolding beauty which we can live in just as easily as the cramping universe of selfishness with which we are generally acquainted. Prayer brings with it the reminiscence of all of this. It reverses our relationship with life completely. It makes us not only sense the presence of a divine power, but to know this power in the various problems that arise. We may still have to use all reasonable judgment in the maintenance of our physical existence, but it becomes an enlightened judgment, a judgment that is clear but in itself charitable. The lack of pressure, the reduction of pressure, releases judgment, which has long been un unable to function because of tension. So again, as we relax, just that fact alone makes us more honest, makes us more discerning, more discriminating, makes us less easy to impose upon, because we are not a party to self-deceit. With prayer giving us all these uh, thoughts in connection with it, and uh, recognizing the relationships of values which we generally ignore, gradually as we enter into a prayerful relationship with life, it is as though we entered into a great cathedral. It is as though this world, uh, which to us previously had been a small molehill whirling around the sun, suddenly becomes a beautiful thing. It becomes a vast expanse of the divine will. 
It becomes truly an infinite life ever manifesting. We look upon everything with a new sense of clarity and charity. A beauty that perhaps we hardly noticed suddenly becomes the voice or expression of divine truth. Things that we accepted as every day and commonplace uh, suddenly become luminous from within themselves with a great healing power. We learn to commune with the mountain and the valley and the lake. We come to experience the fact of deity walking in the garden with us. It is a transformation of the world's appearance simply because we have transformed the faculties within ourselves by which we look upon the world. We have very few ways of gaining this insight by our common ordinary procedures in daily existence. Uh, we do not know of any other road that leads more directly to some kind of sanctification. We see the mountains and the valleys and the shrines and the temples. Uh, we see to each a gate leading in. And we realize that in the search for our own uh, religious life, rather than sectarian denomination or joining this or not joining that, the direct gate that leads in is always this gate of inner quietude and prayerfulness. Wherever we are, whatever the circumstance, the gate to the infinite is always available to us. We can enter into this gate and find ourselves truly in a spiritual sanctuary. Uh, any time, any moment of the day or night, this gate is open. It is truly the, the gate to enlightenment, to peace of soul. And... It is available to us. Nothing can take it from us. Whether we are in the most peaceful environment or upon the battlefield, still this gate, the gate to the infinite, is always there to be uh, achieved by the individual who is quiet, who comes gently and lovingly into the sanctuary of his eternal parent. This cannot be taken from us uh, by any of the ordinary vicissitudes of life. It is always our right and privilege in time of stress or in time of pain to restate our faith. And the daily restatement of faith, even in its simplest form, if it consists merely of simply being quiet for a few moments and sensing or realizing the divine universal presence and voluntarily dedicating ourselves to the service of that presence, this simple process is probably the greatest prayer of all. It is not a prayer for what we want. It is a request uh, that we shall experience the availability of the divine power at all times and in everything. That it is our own blindness that creates false worships and false fears. That we cannot experience the presence of God without in being strangely released from fear. And that as we really believe so our faith becomes very great. And in the presence of faith, we can truly walk upon the storm of life and say to the waves, be still, and they are still. It is to understand through things, to sense their innerness, and to establish forever for ourselves the little path that leads from this world to the eternal, and every prayer is a step on this path, a step voluntarily taken, a step 
uh, which we take because we recognize uh, that this is the old and only way, that it is the proper way, that this way was provided for us, for there was never a time when the path that leads to truth has been closed against us by the heavenly powers. The only doors are the doors in ourselves which we have closed against the light. So if we uh, relax into this, we find that every human heart is a gateway into the eternal. And through our own hearts, we can find our way. And through our own prayers of understanding and sympathy, we can know the strength that we need. For if we are quiet and we simply acknowledge deity, we must at the same time acknowledge the inevitable availability of everything that is necessary. This quietude, this peacefulness, uh, will help us, for it will create a new relation between us and the pattern of existence. And this relation, as it becomes stronger, will overcome our sense of the obsession of worldly problem. Today we are little people with a very great problem. Today we are struggling along through the years, bewildered by the responsibilities and tensions of life. This is not what was originally intended. The only way we can solve this problem is to understand through it, beyond it, and above it, recognizing the true values and the true laws in things. And if we are quiet, the emergencies reduce, for nearly all emergencies arise from ignorance, and that which has its heart and mind dedicated to light will survive its own ignorance and remedy it and finally achieve true insight. So uh, in the daily practice of prayer, we are simply restating for a moment the legitimate sovereignty of deity over its world. We are admitting that beyond the plans and aspirations and schemes of mankind, there is an eternal plan. We are accepting this plan. We are resolved to stand with it to fulfill it, to become instruments of its purpose rather than of our own personal ambitions, and allowing this plan with its natural peace and its immutable law to move in and flow through ourselves, we gradually put our personal lives in order. For there is always within ourselves this ordering power of truth. There is always a lawfulness that will make our lives lawful if we will permit it. And the mystic has always been the one who wanted this lawfulness more than anything else and wanted to live according to truth and knew that the only way that this was possible was to experience truth within and then obey it. This is, I believe, the full a mystical meaning behind the prayer ritual, which has passed through many different phases and expressions, but is identical now from the mystical standpoint with the most ancient prayers of mankind. The need still remains. Prayers are still offered, and they will be. And the degree of insight with which we pray will probably have very much to do with the result of these prayers in our daily lives. Well, our time is up, so we thank you very much. <laughs> now we have several announcements which we think you will be interested in. Next Sunday morning, we are going to approach a psychological problem that has been much discussed, and that is the danger of mystery. And we're going to take up this point in a rather simple way. The unknown can be beautiful. We are all afraid of the unknown. Sometimes we may have some justification, but for the most part, the thing we fear as unknown 
is not bad at all. It is a negative twist again within ourselves that makes the unseen ominous, makes the unexpected dangerous, and makes us arise every morning with fear for the day. This is not a real valid attitude, and we're going to try to discuss that point next Sunday morning. I'd like to announce that after the lecture this morning, the PRS Center Study Group will meet upstairs in the lecture hall, and we'll discuss the talk of the morning. Uh, anyone interested in becoming involved in this discussion or attending this meeting is invited to do so as a guest of the PRS Center Study Group. This meeting will take place directly after the morning talk. I'd like to also point out that there have been a number of persons who have phoned in or asked about our exhibit of playing cards in the library. We hope that you will visit the uh, little exhibit today if you're interested. There are cards of many nations, and many of them have very interesting symbols, and we think you will find them uh, quite delightful. You can also get an art schedule there indicating the nature of our exhibits in the months ahead. Uh, also, we'd like to point out that there will be no lecture here on Sunday, September 6th. You will notice that from the program. That is Labor Day recess, set aside for the benefit of uh, organized labor. Um, I'd like to also uh, announce that... Um, Next Tuesday evening, Dr. Bode, who is continuing his series of lectures on Tuesday, will speak on Tibetan mysticism, psychic phenomena, and their scientific explanations. As you know, Dr. Bode is giving a series of lectures here on Tuesdays, and we hope everyone who is interested will come. Uh, this morning we might announce our publication, The Value of Prayer in Integration, also, our little talk on the Sermon on the Mount, which I think you would find quite helpful. Then there's a new publication, The Kabbalistic Keys to the Lord's Prayer, which I think you may find interesting. And our book, The Mystical Christ, all these may be helpful. Also, in connection with our journal, there is a special offer, which the friends at the table will tell you about. There is uh, a note, our lecture notes, number 65, are available for delivery. Love has no enemies is the subject of the lecture notes uh, that have just been issued. Now, we thank you very much. Hope to see you next Sunday morning. Don't forget to visit the library and the gift shop where we have interesting things for you to see. Something new is showing up all the time, so be sure to take a little look around. Thank you very much.